Welcome to Tell Me Your Truest Story. I'm Karen Miriam Goldberg. This monthly podcast focuses on exploring, unearthing, and at times revising the stories we tell ourselves and are told to find greater freedom, justice, wisdom, and homecoming. Explore with us ways to better align our narratives with our callings and the callings of our time and the living earth. Kelly Hunt. Kelly is a quadruple threat, an exquisite songwriter, virtuoso pianist and guitar player, astonishing singer, and also an amazing arranger of her music, whether for a solo concert or an eight-piece band and several vocalists creating entwined and soaring harmonies and magic together. She's also a vocal, songwriting, and music coach and educator, and she's my co-conspirator for Brave Voice, Writing and Singing for Your Life, an annual retreat we've been rocking since 2006. Kelly often uses the word soulful because that's what she embodies in her music, writing, and simply in the way she moves through this life. I've always been drawn to her songs for their innate healing quality, whether I'm listening at home or sitting in one of the coveted seats as her, at her concerts, or just buddying up to her on the piano as we write yet another song. And yes, one of the great gifts in my life is getting to co-write with Kelly. One of her albums is called Inspiration, and that she is particularly for so many people through the pandemic when she, during the worst of it, did a weekly concert every Saturday night, Facebook Live, free for anyone who wants to attend as a way to tell people, you're not alone, we're here with you. This is what love is about. Here is our interview. I am beyond thrilled to have Kelly Hunt here with me today to talk about music as medicine. Kelly, how are you doing? I'm doing extremely well, Karen. Thanks for having me. Well, it's just a joy to be talking with you about this. Um, As you well know, and a bunch of our listeners may know, we work together. We do brave voice writing and healing retreats, and we write songs, and For me, all of it has to do with stepping into the healing capacity of music and writing. And uh, I'm guessing that's true for you, too. It really is. It it encompasses pretty much everything I do um, out in the world. Uh, Yeah, I can definitely feel that. And one thing that I shared with you is that many times when I go to see you in concert, especially your holiday solstice concerts, that's S-O-U-L instead of S-O-L, and many of your solo concerts, and also sometimes the big concerts with the band with hundreds of other people, I always feel like I've stepped into a healing sanctuary where the music just washes me clear. It's kind of like a a wonderful breeze that just clears away everything that needs to be released. Um, And I'm just so grateful for you doing that for me and so many other people. Wow. Thank you. I'm, I'm honored that you would say that. And I'm so thrilled that that is how it feels for you. That's my, um, Um, that's one of my goals really. Well, let's talk about that as a goal. How conscious are you of, and I know you are, so maybe this is a badly worded question, but (laughs) when you go to perform and when you plan a performance, what's your deepest intention? That's a great question. I've never been asked that before. I think, I think there are a couple of intentions. I think one of them is I would like to be fully present of the moment during that uh, presentation, concert, workshop, whatever that may be. I want to be fully present. And also I'd like people who are attending a concert of mine to leave feeling better than when they came, even if they feel good when they showed up. I would love to raise the energy in a positive way um, and have them feel uplifted 
Mm -hmm. And so many of your songs speak to that in such a direct way. Um, one that comes to mind is your song Freedom Day. And I wonder if you could talk more about that song and what was behind it. Mm. Well, Freedom Day is a special song to me because it was inspired by my mother-in-law, Avis, and uh, who had a powerful spirit. I mean, she was strong, she was smart, she was funny. She was one of the most determined women I knew and very loving, but she had suffered physically a lot in her life. And toward the end of her life, it became very apparent that enough already with the pain. And um, I began to see her in a different way, meaning not as someone who was suffering, but someone who was ready to uh, experience her being in a different way. And that came to me as the idea of freedom. It's her freedom day, not necessarily a dying day, or in her case, evening. Um, and what joy that might bring to her to be released from all of that. And so I kind of, I wrote the song from not necessarily her specifically, but from someone's perspective who was going through that and what the joyful aspect to that became as in, here I go, this is going to be a beautiful thing this will be my release and it's a on the one hand yeah it's very poignant and um an emotional song and for a while I couldn't sing it in public but once I realized it's a universal theme um and that's how that song came about I've had a lot of reaction to that song over the years both in person and um people who've contacted me just fans you know who have sent emails about it and did you ever get a chance to sing her that song? I did. I actually sang it to her a cappella at her bedside. Wow. Yeah. I mean, what a powerful thing to give somebody a song like that when they're in so much pain and they have very often so few days left or so few days they can bear left. So yeah. thank you for doing that. Which kind of leads me to a question maybe on the other end of life. Mm -hmm. When you were a kid, when you were growing up, I know music was always it for you. It was always the thing. But was it also a healing bomb for you as you were growing up? Absolutely. And that started with my mother's voice. I can remember at a very, very early age probably even when I was still in the crib, um, of hearing her voice and having it soothe me and calm me. Um, and then as I got older, because my parents and my older siblings, you know, listened to music a lot, mm -hmm. there was a lot of celebra celebration around music and dancing and joy. Um, it was, it's always been a really positive and very big part of my life. For, for you, were there times when, well, the shit just hit the fan <laughs> or you just felt very sad or suffered a big loss that you found yourself turning to music? Has that been a constant for you? It has. And you know, the first time I can remember that happening, which is kind of funny, this, this just came to me. I, I had a, an amazing third grade teacher mm -hmm. and the group of us that went into her class were kind of in shock because the second grade teacher was, was abusive and ended up getting fired. And so we entered third grade, really scared, not wanting to say much, not wanting to do much. Mm -hmm. And as it turns out, <clears throat> this teacher was loving. She knew what had happened and she had put on a little, she decided to do a weekly show and tell, but it was kind of more like a variety show <laughs> where you could play or sing or do whatever you wanted. And that kind of helped open us up. So that was a wonderful thing. And 
I had listened to a lot of music on the radio because mom always had it on or dad. And I really loved the song Ring of Fire. (laughs) Yeah, Johnny Cash. And uh, as a third grader, I just sat down um, at that in the class when we had our our time of sharing and banged out Ring of Fire on the piano. And she was very accepting and everybody clapped. And it wasn't about me wanting to perform. It was about me feeling once again free to express myself in a setting where I wouldn't be judged or verbally abused by a teacher. And at the end of the year, when it was time for us to, you know, graduate from third grade and go on to fourth, I was very sad to say goodbye to her. And I went home after we had our last day of school and I sat at the old upright piano that my parents used to have and I just played and sang my heart out and I let my little third grade grief come out in the Mm -hmm. music and then I felt better. So that's the first time I can remember that many times, you know, many, many times since. And I know for me, when I think about um, some of the hardest times I had for me, they were more when I was a teenager, I remember listening to Joni Mitchell's Blue so much that I inhabited every single note, every space between the notes, every word, you know, the album cover in my hands was just this sacred thing. Did you have music like that that was there for you in that kind of way? Um, I'd say yes. At different times in my life, it was different music. Um, There was a time when I was listening to writers like Carol King, Joni Mitchell, and James Taylor. Mm-hmm. Um, and I guess I would have been in junior high school. And they just spoke to me uh, in a deep way. And sometimes I think as adults, um, maybe not necessarily us, but some adults tend to think that perhaps children or adolescents don't feel things as deeply, but boy, do we ever. And those writers really helped me. And then there were a lot of the Motown artists that my brother and sister were listening to and that were just get down, dance, party, have fun, um, that allowed me to kind of release some of that little teenage angst. Um, And yeah, so those are the things that helped me growing up musically. Yeah. And for many of us, we just keep coming back to it, you know, and I, I'm thinking of a song you and I wrote called music was the thread mm. and a song of somebody who was suffering tremendously, a young boy growing up and everything was falling apart and music was the thread. Music was the way he got through. Yes. Yeah, and I I loved writing that song because we were, you know, we put details into the song <clears throat> that could help describe many, many, unfortunately, many uh, young people, you know, what they had to deal with at home and how did they manage to stay in school and keep going. Um, music was the thread, and I saw it as a lifeline. And it certainly has been for me in different ways. I I grew up in a very happy home, so I didn't have that. But um, it's been a lifeline uh, throughout my entire life. Yeah, no matter how we grow up, life is going to get us one way or another. (laughs) We all know, as we well know. And it also makes me think about, you know, the theme of this podcast is Tell Me Your Truest Story. And I wanted to speak to you because your songs to me are so much a true story, each one of them, not necessarily a story story in in all cases, but a moment that opens up and invites us in to see and understand more about where we are at this moment in our lives and what the possibilities are. And I kind of wonder if you'd like to in light of this, talk about a a song I know that was a very much a true story for you in many dimensions, The Beautiful Bones. Oh, Oh, I'd love to talk about that. Well, The Beautiful Bones came about when I was sitting in my kitchen on a really cold, cold January day looking at 
uh, 14 inches of snow. We live out in the country and a big um, silver maple tree who, of course, had bare branches at that time. And I was playing a guitar that was given to me as a surprise Christmas present from my husband, Al, and my friends, Jane and Lee. And just playing the guitar just in a relaxed way, not to be writing, but just to be relaxing. And I looked out that window and the tree suddenly looked like a beautiful hand that was reaching toward the sky. And I had the a moment of clarity that said these no matter the season, it's a metaphor, this tree, it's beautiful, but the bones are always there. And then it began to come to mind of the, our world and the natural world that's around us and how we must take care of it because it may seem fine on the outside in some places of the world, but the bones are always underneath. And if we don't take care, um, then we're all in trouble. And Honestly, that song came very, very quickly, and I didn't really deeply understand it until a little bit later. And sometimes that happens. I don't, I don't know about you, but especially yeah. with songwriting, it's such a, it's just a little capsule of time. Unlike, you know, a novel or even a short story, it's a very small little snapshot uh, with a, a theme that's compressed. And when I go back and listen to some songs, even I wrote five, 10, 20, 30 years ago, I sometimes understand them more now. Um, uh -huh. I've, I've, lived, I've lived more life, but the beautiful bones um, really almost wrote itself and it resonated with me in a way that I still perform it at uh, a lot of my uh, concerts. Yeah, and I really hear that song also echoing so much through generations, you know, before us and generations ahead. And yes, which makes and, me more. <clears throat> well, you know what I what I what used to happen to me when I first started doing that the Beautiful Bones tour because that's the name of the record when it came out. When when I would step up to sing it, you know, with my guitar. I would visualize without trying a lot of the women in my family who came before me kind of standing behind me in a semicircle. And I never had that experience before. I mean, these were not just my, you know, my mother, my grandmother, my great grandmothers, but some of those ancestors that came before who were standing there with me. And that was unusual and felt very, very healing to me as a woman um with that lineage well i know you and i have both had experiences where music or what we create suddenly makes us feel like we're in the presence of those who came before us that it has that echo and this also makes me think about another song we co-wrote which is miracle i was sitting mm -hmm. on my gravel driveway with my arm around the late great shay the dog yeah, um, it was just a mild day and I was watching the sky. It was getting close to sunset and the words just came to me around rainbow is called the glory. What we survive in life is called the story. You never see the arc of it during or until after the storm to see the whole miracle. You've got to hold on. The work a day miracle is where you belong. Mm -hmm. And that's also the theme song for this podcast, because so much of what we experience in life, if we can just hold on, we see the arc of it, we start to see the story. We can't see when we're in it, what it might mean to us, how it might be challenging or changing us, what healing potential it has just unfurling in our own lives right now. But we can hold on and then we'll find that work a day miracle. Right. And as soon as you sent those lyrics to me, <clears throat> I immediately heard music to go with that. And then a couple of verses came in that came to me because of a family member who had been struggling so much. And I was, I felt like I was saying it to them. And uh -huh. 
what I've realized too since that time, and I'm sure you have too, is this is a universal theme. This is many, many people's story, which is mm -hmm. this is my darkest hour. Will it ever end? And the truth is, yes, it will. It will end, but you've got to hold on. And I love you only see the arc of it after the storm. And, you know, of course, living in Kansas, I've <laughs> grown up with rainbows uh, literally in my yard off and on all my life. And it's a it's a beautiful take on um, survival and what something, you know, something beautiful may come eventually through the hardest times. Absolutely. And it it also makes me I don't want to make this all about our songs, but I have to bring in another one. Oh, OK, an early song we wrote. Well, actually, the very first song we wrote mm -hmm. um, love heals but not the way you think and we were commissioned to write that for an event featuring your music and my poetry and a dance troupe um, thanks to candy baker and the lawrence arts center and it was shortly after i had finished my treatment for breast cancer and i go back to those lyrics over and over love heals but not the way you think and in some ways, that could be the theme of many songs we've written. <laughs> yes, true. Yeah. I, I was going to say, I loved that that was the first thing that we wrote because you and I had known each other, but we'd never written together. And it happened in, from, from my perspective in such an easy, seamless way. And you were telling your story. You were, you were yes. giving your perspective. And I was so happy to be there for that and to provide you know uh, just to be a co-writer and to put music to it and add a few words here and there but i i just thought it was really courageous and beautiful of you to uh tell that story and tell it directly well thank you and the music you provide it made it possible to bring in just the little details like walk out to a parking lot I can't remember our lyrics exactly, but that moment after the diagnosis, yeah. you look out in a parking lot, you look at the sky and you go, oh, right. yeah. And um, it also makes me think of the little stories we wove into another song called Love, where yeah. you know each, each verse is a tiny vignette of somebody finding ways to love. And uh, of course, we started that one while eating French toast and bacon at the old Milton's, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> See, their love was so big, all heaven broke loose. Yeah. And what came to us as we were eating breakfast was, I said their love was so big, and you said all heaven broke loose. And yeah. we were talking about people at opposite ends of the planet who find a way to be together. We were talking about a widow finding a way to go on when the space of his absence is all that she needs. Mm -hmm. And this also makes me think about how so many of the songs that you've written, whether you've written with me or phenomenal other co-writers or written on your own, or that you recorded, have to do with finding that innate resilience, that deep faith that, um, that you can find a way through even when everything looks really bleak, that you can find what gives you courage, what makes you strong. And so I have to ask you about a, a cover you did for Jesse Winchester's That's What Makes You Strong. Well, that song was brought to me by one of the co-producers of the New Shade of Blue album, uh, Gary Nicholson. He's also someone I've co-written with. And as we were picking songs for the album, everything that I had done previously to that, I had had I'd written all of it or co-written all of it. Um, but he said, you know, I've got this song by Jesse Winchester, who at the time was still alive and living in Nashville where I was recording. Um, and he sat he sat down and got out his guitar and he played it for me and he played it. Uh, it's of course sort of a folk kind of a country style, but I was so smitten with the words and the music. And I said on the spot, I said, well, I have to record that, but I'm going to do it uh, with my own arrangement. Of course, I did not change one word and I kept, you know, the basic music the same, but the feel of it for me is more goes back to my kind of gospel and blues roots. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. And Jesse Winchester, who has since passed away, had a unique skill of making things sound simple and easy until you tried to emulate that until you really went back and listened to what those words said. There were many, many layers to every what seemingly simple line he wrote. Every song of his told a specific story. And yeah. that one in general, it knocked me off my seat. I loved it so much. And that's another song I fold into many of my live performances still. Yeah, well, his I completely hear you on what he's what you're saying about how he makes all these layers of life and loving and being fully alive sound simple, you know, in his first verse, if you love somebody, that's, then that means you need somebody. And if you need somebody, that's what makes you weak. But if you know you're weak and you know, you need someone, oh, it's a funny thing. That's what makes you strong. Yes. It's just so brilliant. And a lot of your music just does the same thing, not just the songs you cover, but the songs you bring together. Oh, thank you. You know, you kind of show um, what Brene Brown calls the vulnerability we have to have to be courageous. Mm -hmm. And I wonder if you might say a little bit about your song, Mercy, where that's just so much at the heart of that song. Oh, gosh. Um... Mercy was inspired by several things, but it really is just a kind of a come to Jesus moment, if you will, that says, listen, we are all suffering and we need to forgive ourselves. We must forgive ourselves first and then we must forgive each other. That was that was a reaction to what was happening in the Iraq war at the time. I had a former brother-in-law who was over there. I had a, a nephew who was there and it was brutal and really hard on the family. And it has, the first line is, Lord, don't let me die alone. Hold my hand when you take me home. Because there are so many people um, all over our world in different circumstances who do end up alone, who, who are crying out for help. And I realized as I was writing that, I was saying, to myself, not only the lines that end the song, may we all have mercy now, but may um, may we all give mercy now. And yes. it was kind of a deep and wide uh, moment in my writing life. Again, that another song that came fairly quickly that I, I've understood more as I've had uh, even more time away uh, from writing it more times since it was written. Yeah, that's a song that just keeps getting stronger and truer over time. And the final song I want to ask you about is one about cultural healing. During the last uh, the last administration of He Who Will Not Be Named, you <laughs> started performing the song Stand Up. And I've been in so many concerts when you did that, and I could just see everybody in the audience was lifted up, you know, no matter their politics, no matter their background, that sense of standing up for each other, standing up for what's good in us. Well, that song was completely inspired by what was happening in the world at the time. And the song, the lines that repeat throughout the, you know, after the different verses is stand up, stand on the side of love. And I'm not necessarily trying to tell people what to think or what politics to, you know, enfold in their life or a spouse. What I'm saying is, you know, for all of our sakes, for God's sake, you know, stand up, make make yourself be heard, stand where absolutely on the side of love. And I, I believe love is a verb. It's powerful. It's strong. It's ever present. And that song um was my way of saying i'm not okay with what's happening specifically in in my world in our united states during a specific time period and this is my way of addressing it and reaching out and saying we must you know 
stand yes, stand up. Love. Yeah, stand and up. I know I said that was the last song I would ask you about, but I've obviously <laughs> lied because I realize there's a, you know, there's been a component in your music for years that has, that has made your concerts uh, a refuge for the LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. And that's gone on for many, many years. But I've also uh, really experienced in your recent Solstice concert and in many other concerts that you've done a call for racial healing. Yes. And I know a song that we wrote together, Shine On. What is it? Shine the Light. Jeez, why can't I remember the names of our song? Shine the Light yes. um, speaks to that. But it also feels like that call for really looking at what's happening, what's needed in this country across race, as well as across many other divides, is so strong in your music. Well, thank you. You know, I think uh, as, as an artist, and I know that you experience this too, no matter where, how you're expressing yourself, you know, artistically, whatever that medium may be, you know, it behooves us to stay authentically who we are and mm -hmm. at who we are at our very core. It doesn't mean that, you know, we can't have fun and have some, you know, really rock and fun references. But I believe that a lot of it because my upbringing and I guess just who I am, I feel that a connection with on a worldwide basis with the human condition, human beings. Mm -hmm. And when I see things happen, you know, to other human beings in uh, Ferguson, Missouri, or uh, Minnesota, or wherever that may be, to a person of color for no good reason, and it's brutal and it's traumatizing, especially to to people of color, it makes me feel even more deeply that as an artist, I may never know at their level what that feels like for them. I can only comment on it as an observer, and it, but we are all human. Mm -hmm. And so I just, I just feel like, hey, I'm here. I'm on the planet right now. I'm not messing around. I want to have fun. I want to entertain, but I need to be my authentic self and say what it is. I need to say, this is the story I'm living right now. And I so appreciate it when I see that and, and hear that and feel that from, from others. Absolutely. And it makes me think of something songwriter Greg Greenway once said to me about a song he wrote. And he has done a lot of songs that look at privilege and race and what's going on in this country as best he can discern. And he said he realized he was blind to so much of that was happening because of racism. And when he realized that he wondered, well, what else am I blind to? Yes. But in your music and, you know, this is very much part of the folk music tradition, but also deep in blues and rhythm and blues and Americana, even yeah. rock and roll to some extent, it's mm -hmm. about making visible what's happening as much as we can, not to say that every song has to be, and we don't want songs to be didactic, beat you over the head, but make visible that there are things that we're blind to or that we don't see clearly happening all around us. And the more we can open our eyes, the more we can be present, the more we can speak and act for change. And so much of your music does exactly that. It makes this world visible. Well, thank you. That's, I appreciate that. I'm, I, hope that that's the case well and it will keep being the case because we just keep um we keep unfolding ourselves and going where we're called and writing what comes right absolutely yeah and when you and i work together we often will yell out incoming because there's something <laughs> else it may not work but it's it's trying to break through and we'll see what it is so Thank you so much for this time and this conversation. And it's a pleasure to have you here. And of course, people can find you at kellyhunt.com, Kelly with two E's, K-E-L-L-E-Y, hunt.com. And we'll have that in the notes that go with this podcast too. Oh, that's great. I so appreciate it. And thank you for having me on this soulful podcast and thank you Karen for all the 
amazing work and uh, love that you put into your work out into the world. We all appreciate you. was from Freedom Day by Kelly Hunt, and she also performed it there. Please see the notes with this podcast for links to many of the songs we talked about and to learn more about what Kelly is creating and putting out into the world these days. Thank you so much for listening to Tell Me Your Truest Story. Please subscribe to my podcast at Karen Miriam Goldberg. Dot podbean dot com, or l- visit my website for the link to find out more about workshops, writings, happenings, and my latest blog post at KarenMiriamGoldberg.com. That's C-A-R-Y-N-M-I-R-R-I-A-M-G-O-L-D-B-E-R-G. You can also find Tell Me Your Truest Story on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Special thanks to Kelly Hunt for the use of her music from our co-written song, The Road is Just a River. And please catch up with more of Kelly's music at kellyhunt.com. That's Kelly with two E's, K-E-L-L-E-Y. Thank you to Diana Burrup for our logo. May you find greater truth and joy, peace and wonder, in your own truest stories.